at the start of the service, how well do you know others? And I want to ask you a different question now. How well do you know yourself? So it's an interesting question, isn't it? How well do we know ourselves? And um, I love I love this psalm because it, it has a personal a, a personal touch. There's an intimacy within this psalm. And um, the more that David spent with God, the more that that relationship grew, the more that God uh, knew about him. So this is the premise of the of today's message that um, this psalm is a very personal account of David, a very personal account of his relationship with God. It's almost like a realisation that David has that he comes to about God, that he's all-knowing and he is everywhere. <coughs> the fact there is no place that, that David could go uh, to that God would not be. So he is everywhere. And he explores these, these active qualities about God when, when he relates to his people. And um, in the structure of it, says at the, at the top here, it's got a description of God's intimate knowledge of his servant. He knows him. There's a celebration of God's presence with David. There's a celebration of God's creation of David from the moment of conception. A declaration that God's thoughts towards David are innumerable. A prayer for punishment of God's enemies. And then there's a prayer that God might search and lead David. So who is David? So let's take a quick summary on David's life just to jog our memories. So we see that he, he's a Jewish king who was known for his peace, humility, his faith, and his skill as a songwriter. The Bible describes David as a man after God's heart who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord most of his life. And as a boy, he worked as a shepherd for his father's flock. He had great musical talent. He learned to play and compose songs while shepherding. It was at this time that God rejected Saul as king and the Israelites because of his disobedience and told the prophet Samuel to secretly anoint young David as the next king. And as a young man, David became more well known after re re representing the Israelite army against Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. The reign of King David was blessed by God as he served the people and he was a faithful king in contrast to Saul. Yet even a great man of faith like David was still a sinner, tempted by evil desires in a time when he should have been out leading his, his army in battle. He lusted after the beauty of Bathsheba, the wife of one of his soldiers. David had her brought to his palace and committed adultery with her and then tried to cover up, following resulting to planning her husband's murder on the battlefield. God judged David for his wickedness by allowing those seeds of violence and lust to destroy four of David's sons. Yet God was still willing to forgive David, allowed him to keep his kingdom, accepted his repentance, and even called David and Bathsheba's second son, Solomon, loved by God. So that's a little bit of a, a quick kind of snapshot <laughs> on who uh, David is. So as we dive into Psalm 139, the first verse, we're going to just concentrate a little bit on this first verse, because I, I think this is the, the golden thread of what this, uh, this passage and this chapter is all about. So the first verse says to us, oh, I'll try and see if we get this work. There we go. Oh Lord, you have sent in my heart and know everything about me. The thing about that word examine, I know the, what John read out said search, but I kind of like the word examine. I, I kind of picture it to, you know, somebody has a magnifying glass and they're sort of really concentrating in, really zeroing in and, and finding all the little nooks and crannies and, and every little detail, intricate detail, somebody that is, that is searching and examining us um, quite intently. And if you look up the word in the dictionary, it tells us this. It says, examining is inspect someone or something thoroughly in order to determine their nature or condition. So isn't that what God was doing? He was examining God's heart to determine the nature or the condition of his heart. There is nothing that God, David could do to allow God not to examine his heart. God knows what is deep in his heart. 
the kind of things that perhaps David wanted to keep hidden from God was not hidden. God searched his heart, examined it, and he knows everything about it. So why the heart? When you think about why, why is God so concerned for the heart? Why is God examining the heart? The human heart in its natural condition is evil, treacherous and deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In other words, the fall has affected us at the deepest level. Our mind, emotions and desires have been tainted by sin. And we are blind to just how pervasive that problem is. We may not understand our hearts, but God does. And let's say in Psalms 44:21, He knows the secrets of our hearts. How's that? Have we ever tried to keep a secret down in our heart? And go, God, don't search there, don't look at me, don't examine it. He knows already. He knows what's in our heart. As Jesus has said, he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of men, for he knew what was in men. Based on his knowledge of the heart, God can judge righteously. I, the Lord, search the heart, I testify, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Jeremiah 17.10 Jesus pointed out the fallen condition of our hearts. In Mark 7, 21-23, tells us, From within, out of the man's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Whew, that's a lot, isn't it? All these evils come from the inside and make the person unclean. Our biggest problem is not the external, but the internal. All of us have a heart problem. In order for a person to be saved, then the heart must be changed. This only happens by the power of God in response to faith. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. Romans 10.10, 10. there we go. In his grace, God can create a new heart within us. He promises to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It says there, The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says, Isn't life, isn't life in, the, in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble? Restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the corrupt courage of those with repentant hearts. The heart, the heart is a core of our being. And the Bible says, sets high importance on keeping our hearts pure. It says here, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 4.23. So as you can see by these verses, the heart is the centre for not only our spiritual activity, but the centre of our very being. David continues here. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. How awesome is that? He knows everything about us. In our active lives as we live it, our everyday thing, in the minuscule things that we do during the day, God is there with us. I think it's fair to kind of say that God knows us better than we know ourselves. 
particular. The all-knowing God from inner thoughts to the outer ways, these verses are full of verbs of knowing. The general statement of these verses is applied to life's outward activities and inner thoughts, everyday acts and lifestyles, and unexpressed thoughts, David's personal life falls wholly within the divine limits as God blesses him as he goes about his day. And he blesses us as well as we go about our own day. So God knows everything. How's that? Even in Matthew, it says that even the hairs on our heads are numbered. Can you think about that? Think about, you know, trying to count the hairs on your head. Now, I don't have too many. I've got a couple. But can you think about it? That God knows every single hair that is on our heads. I think that's just mind-boggling to think. How well he knows us. The next couple of verses that David uh, has here is God being present with us. And from verse 7 it says to us here, I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. If I could ask the darkness to hide me, and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. God is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. Because of this, there's nowhere where we can escape from His Spirit. Which is really good news for us who love God. Because no matter what we do, where we go, we can never be far from God's comforting presence. How comforting is that? No matter where we are, where we go, to the depths of the earth, to the highest place in the heavens, God is there with us. Romans 8, 35 says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered by sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, not our angels nor demons, not our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from Christ's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter where we are, He is right there with us. If we're having a good week, a good day, He's right there. If we're not having a good week or a good day, He is right there as well. No matter what, He is there. That alone should be great comfort for us, shouldn't it? That knowledge that God is ever present within us. I'm going to skip down now to the last bit of this passage, which is verse 23 and 24, which says to us Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I love how 
This does a bit of a, a 360. It comes back straight to what David was saying in the beginning. The psalm ends as it began with the acknowledgement of God searching, or examining, and knowing. Although David was determined to hold God's holy standard, at the same time he knew his motives and obedience were imperfect. So David concluded here by asking God to see if there is any hurtful in him. And if so, lead him in the path of everlasting or the upright way of God. How is that? Can we do that ourselves? Can we say to God, here I am. Come in, examine my heart. See if there's anything in there that's not of you. See if there's any malice within me. Search me and let me know. So then we can do something about it and come to a way of everlasting and being upright with God. I think this psalm sort of, these words that David speaks here, just echoes. Psalm 19 and 14, he said, he says to us, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, the Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's what David was saying. He's asking God to come in, examine him. He wants to be one with God and to say, come in and may the words that I speak, may the, may the thoughts that I have be connected to you and be of you. Psalm 139 should give us great comfort. It should prompt us to remain obedient to God. It is an acknowledgement of how awesome God is, that He's all known, all present with us. There is nothing that we can hide that God doesn't already know about. He knows all the intricate details of us. And let that be a reminder for all of us today. I have a song um, that I want to bring to you today. It's a song that sort of kicked off this thought about God just knowing us so well. And it's a song by Matthew West. And he writes this song as a reminder to himself that he's fallen. And thanks, Bruno. <laughs> You're trying to get, get rid of me already. Um, <laughs> it falls. <laughs> It's a song that Matthew West writes and he's reminding himself that he is a fallen man, that nobody expects him to be perfect. Instead, he needs to be authentic with other people and to be honest with God, who knows his heart anyway. He struggled with that because he's been in the spotlight, he's on stage, he's worshipping, he's, he's going around and doing concerts for people. So he's constantly in the presence of others. And he had this need where he felt he had to be perfect, and then God just shook him, got a hold of him, and said, No, you don't. You are not perfect, but I want you to be genuine. I want you to be authentic. And that was his prayer, and that's what led him to write this song, which is called Truth Be Told. Now you can go for it now. Thank you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this, this message. I want to thank you for placing it on my heart. That no matter where we are, no matter what we do, you are right there with us and you know us so deeply. I want to thank you for that song by Matthew West that he, that he recognises the need for you, that he recognises that he's not perfect like us. But we come to you today and ask you today to remove anything that it should not be within us, 
May you examine our hearts. May you examine our minds and take away what's not of you. Thank you again for this reminder for all of us today as we do just that. In Jesus' name, Amen.